I don't claim to have all the answers, but one of the problems is there's this kind of false equivalency, right? That, you know, scientists with, you know, who devoted their lives to certain topics uh, will, will, you know, take that extra measure to engage the public. And then there's an opposing side that will drag out someone often with some scientific credentials, but, you know, they're not really in, in that field or, and then, and that's somehow, there's this false equivalency that's somehow been created and, and that creates a lot of danger too. I mean, you're seeing this play out right now, uh, right uh, from the White House. Uh, they're parading out this guy, um, uh, what's his name, Scott Atlas, uh, who's a physician and with some credentials, right? I think he was a professor of neuroradiology at Stanford and that's, you know, that's uh, substantial. But he's he's uh, you know sending out a lot of half baked ideas about infectious diseases and in and you know then the White House will say well you can't dismiss him he's a Stanford professor well yeah he's a Stanford professor but you know I, and I and I'm a Baylor College of Medicine professor but I don't start spouting off crazy theories about functional MRI right <laughs> in, in in the brain and so we've got to figure out a uh, there, there's got to there's got to be a better way, and I think part of it has to do with really getting scientists in their fields feeling more comfortable uh, communicating with the public. Part of the problem is the ecosystem doesn't nurture it, right? Academic health, often academic health centers, office of communications don't like their doctors and scientists out in the public domain. They like to control the message. Uh, not not where I am, but in some places, and 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 because they have a different mission, their their mission is to protect the reputation of the institution. Whereas when people like myself speak out, we're doing it because we we feel very passionate about the subject, right, and feel and and want to speak out on social justice issues and other issues, which is not always fully in law, fully aligned with those of the academic health centers and. And that, so not only, so we have two problems. One, the academic health center, one often does not nurture it. As I said, this has not been a problem where I am at Baylor and Texas Children's, but I've seen it at other places. And second, you often see academic health centers actually discouraging their scientists from speaking out. Uh, and so people don't feel comfortable. No, nobody wants to, uh, people are willing to do it, but they don't want to throw their career on the rocks to do it. It, it is interesting speaking as a journalist on that because there are certain people you you want to talk to, but there's a lot of red tape for them being able to speak out. That's also been something I've noticed with healthcare workers like nurses or nursing home care workers. It's very hard to, you, you know, you, you want to be seen as part of the team you, at, at in some health systems, not as somebody who's who's putting things out on the chopping block. And I think if we had a less judgmental understanding and, and sort of to, to your point though, let people feel a little bit more comfortable without kind of restraining that, Oh, you had this view. So you are fired or you had this view and you've reflected poorly on the institution. I mean, there, there has to be some defense of academic freedom. And then at the same time, it has to be such a vigorous debate that when somebody comes along with snake oil, that that the people who are in that field are comfortable to say, like, no, that's not really the answer. It's a little more complicated than that. Right. And and also, and it's not only the fault of the uh, the hospital or the academic health center, the you know, the the science journalism community uh, can go through an upgrade as well. I mean, you know, at some point somebody in schools of communication handed down the edict that all science communication must be conducted at the sixth grade level. <laughs> that, so that everything has to be really dumbed down and simplified. And, and off, you know, for years I've had tremendous frustration trying to convey nuance and, and yet the, you know, the editor of a, of a newspaper will you know, sensationalize it or, or really dumb it down to the point where it's almost not true or even actually actually false. And uh, and I, you know, one of the nicest things anyone ever said to me was, 
my, one of my editors at Johns Hopkins Press who said, you know, Peter, you have the ability to convey complicated ideas without sounding like you're speaking down to people or talking to them like they're in the sixth grade. Or, and, and I think that's a problem with uh, a lot of the media outlets if they're still very fixed on uh, dumbing this down and simplifying it. And, and so it's a balance between using a lot of jargon uh, and confusing people versus the other extreme of dumbing things down. I think the dumbing things down is, is really dangerous, especially now when you're trying to convey some pretty complicated ideas around which vaccines might be better than others for COVID-19, why, you know, the phase one data are not miracle data, that you know, it's only been 10 individuals who got two doses of the vaccine that seem to show some levels of neutralizing antibody and why you can't go from that to saying, you're gonna have a licensed vaccine to distribute to 300 million people. There's not enough of us out there sort of explaining that uh, and, and we need more of it. Uh, it's a little better now in the last few months because scientists are out there uh, in the public domain more than they've ever been in a long time uh, because of COVID-19, but we still have a long way to go. I can definitely speak as a journalist to being part of that dynamic for sure. You, you're, you're trying to represent this really weird nexus of politics, civil society, and, and, and connect those things. And, and this is the first pandemic response where every scientist's opinion and evolving understanding is, is live on a screen and mixed in with all this political discourse. Um, so we get new information out in the COVID literature that is coming from the experts. You're trying to incorporate it into a comprehensive understanding without forcing it to pass biases. But then we also all have biases in, in, in science. So, and, and then you have the vast majority of the public that is, I think for justified reasons, very interested in having a say in these large social changes that are going on and, and these big ticket decisions. But I, I also think there's this heightening of, you know, when scientists try to get out there and talk about their reasons for supporting different policies, there's hate mail, there's anger that's directed at people who are trying to weigh in with insights and proposals when it's, it's political leaders who make policy decisions. I mean, and, and oftentimes I think the blowback doesn't necessarily go to leadership when something goes wrong it, it goes to people on both sides of maybe a scientific debate that is then transposed very awkwardly onto a political debate that was happening kind of parallel yeah there, there's a couple of ways that you're absolutely right i think there's a couple of ways i try to handle it one when i make a statement especially if it's a statement that kind of goes against the grain of what others are saying i try to explain the basis for it, and and it's and and sometimes you just don't get the airtime to to do that, and and that's really important. And I think that people have found that very helpful. That I don't just make a statement; I I spend a minute or so quickly explaining how I got to that point, and I think people find that 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 extremely helpful. Um, I think the other is is the fact that. As scientists, we are allowed to have political views, and this this is also uh, a, 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 a little bit tougher one. So, for instance, you know, in the beginning of COVID nineteen, I was going on the air all the time, and and really only focusing on the science, not venturing into the political realm. But finally, you know, when I saw how you know low income neighborhoods were being decimated by this, uh, especially, you know, in, in the southern states here in Texas. And there was, and, and I felt that the White House was turning their back on low-income neighborhoods, Hispanic neighborhoods in particular. You know, my wife was seeing how upset I was getting, and she finally said to me, look, Peter, you know, if you don't want to wait till the fall and find out that, you know, when the final tally comes and you've seen historic decimation of Hispanic populations that you didn't do all you could to speak out against the social injustice uh, uh, and, and a prejudice. And so I had to take that step. Uh, and, and again, it's, it's, it's a tough space. It's all new territory for me trying to 
to, na to navigate it, but I felt it was really important. So the point is only commenting on the science, I felt itself when I knew that people were suffering, uh, I felt itself was an immoral position. So it, gets, it does get murky and it can get murky pretty quickly. Dr. Hotez, I, I will open the floor to any, anything else you want to add, but I think that was uh, a lot of insight for people to chew on. So up to you. Good. No, I think that's, um, as I said, I would, I would just kind of end by, you know, saying that, that we do need a way to have a new generation of scientists out there in the public domain, uh, willing, willing to speak out on important issues and conveying scientific information. I think young people are all in, they're all ready for it. We just have not created a nurturing environment to make people feel comfortable doing that. And, and I think that too, that speaks to a certain need for community engagement where I think people on the public side, there should be more awareness on the public side also of how open scientists are to disagreement when it's um, collegial. You know, and that doesn't mean you literally have to be a colleague, but um, if you're questioning something in science, that doesn't make you anti-science. It's, it's once you start attacking people individually or you, you know, the, the, if you have a question, ask a question, or if you have a comment and, and a thought, you can do that politely and, and, and be part of the discussion instead of this polarized both sides are hating each other thing. I mean, I don't know about your thoughts on that, but it's just something that comes out of it for me. Well, well, what happens often, for instance, you know, uh, children's health defense and other pretty yeah, these are political groups, vaccine right? groups, yeah. you know, they yeah. put out these fake ideas. Uh, and, and what happens yeah. is that, and then they get repeated. And so oftentimes, uh, what's what might seem to somebody is an innocent question. You know where it's coming from. It's one of the tropes coming out of children's health defense, and it's in fact a a form of of microaggression and not even all that micro. And so conveying that is also really complicated. That that makes a lot of sense too, because you often find skepticism because of these political groups. Skepticism itself becomes channeled down these pathways that are unproductive or that just parrot kind of these talking points that don't really get it yeah why is it's, the social it, response it, it, it's 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 you know to someone who doesn't know it's couched as kind of a legitimate question and it's often very adjacent to legitimate questions yeah, so yeah. It, i think if we had a societal conversation about like vaccines cause these adverse events, one of the things people would understand better is that mild adverse events are signs of vaccine works. That's one of the, that's one of the examples where, you know, when you have the new COVID vaccines, the information coming out and it's like, wow, 80% of people got like a little cold after or something like that. But that's a, not a real number, by the way, that's just a oh. hypothetical. That if you had that conversation just broke, if you just kind of were able to break through that culture war Gordian knot somehow on so many of these different conversations, then it actually wrong foots some of those political groups too that are trying to push a very black and white anti-science narrative on it. So I think it's, I think it's, it's to your point earlier too about the sound bites are not helpful because a lot of the anti-science stuff is very adjacent to real ethical debates that scientists have, but then you just do this one little trick, you know, something like that. Yeah, I mean, the, sometimes, you know, these groups will put out right falsehoods or lies. More often, it's, it's a half-truth take, taken out of context and manipulated in a way that serves their own political purposes. And that's, that takes practice to, to diffuse. It's not, it's not as easy. That's not as easy. Dr. Hotez, thanks again. Much appreciated. Thank you. All the best.